Forest Dhamma Audio presents Gold Wrapped in Rags The Autobiography of Ajahn Jia Chundo Translated from the Thai by Ajahn Dixila Ratano Read by AI Generated Voices This audio recording was produced solely for free distribution. You are welcome to share the recording with others, but it should not be sold under any circumstances. Introduction Dawn Imagine for a moment the desperation felt by ordinary peasant farmers in southeastern China during the first decade of the 20th century, when living conditions had become untenable for poor farmers throughout the region. During extended periods of drought, the land lay parched. When the rains returned, the rivers flooded the lowlands. Either way, year after year, the conditions for harvesting crops were disastrous. Without rice to eat, life became desperate. To make matters worse, the general lawlessness of the region gave rise to raids by marauding gangs of armed men looting depleted grain supplies. Sia Ong, the eldest son of an ethnic Hokkien family, grew up in a village in Fujian province, alongside a river which flooded its banks so often that the rice crops frequently failed, leaving his family to survive on a meager harvest each year. As typhoons swept in over the mountains and onto the low-lying countryside, storm winds blew without respite, and dense lashing rain fell steadily for months, drenching everything. When water levels rose until they overflowed the river's banks, the rushing current started devouring the embankment, pulling the land into the surging torrent. The river swelled and flowed faster as its momentum grew, gobbling up everything in its path and spilling over so far that it inundated the rice fields. The ensuing floods washed everything away, not just the family's fields but their home as well. Everything the family owned ended up floating in the middle of the river. All that remained of their house above water was the thatched roof stubbornly hanging on against the flood tide. Half-starved farm animals clung to the debris floating in the water, and human corpses beginning to bloat and rot bobbed in the swirling eddies. When the rain stopped, the sun beat down and wafts of stench drifted off the river. The scenes of destruction were reminiscent of what the Buddha realized on the night of his enlightenment, that the cycle of birth and death resembles an ocean of suffering. After the flood, the young man's family packed what few possessions they had left and trekked across the high mountains into the next valley to stay with relatives and try to start their lives anew. There they built thatched huts in the open fields and eked a living out of the land. The following year drought descended, scorching the land and shriveling their crops. When he could no longer endure the feelings of despair, Sia Ong reached a pivotal moment in his young life. One morning, as dawn broke across the barren fields, he bid a tearful goodbye to his parents and left home in search of a better future. He set out on foot over the parched floodplain south of his home, hiking through the flat, hard landscape scarred with the stubble of a drought-stricken rice crop. Full of youth, he was strong and capable of walking long distances without tiring. He took few possessions with him, only some extra clothes stuffed in his Chinese traveling case, a tall, rounded basket made of woven bamboo that he carried suspended from a shoulder pole. Sia Ong was twenty-two years old and on his own. Like so many young men of that era, he joined a mass migration fleeing the severe hardships of southern China in search of greener, fresher pastures in the lands of Southeast Asia. He had heard from the tales of previous migrants that lands to the far south were peaceful and plentiful. His plan was simple, keep walking south until he reached the sea, then stow away in the hold of a merchant vessel sailing southwest and plying its trade at cities and towns along the eastern coast of the Southeast Asian mainland. When a favorable opportunity presented itself, he intended to disembark and seek employment on the mainland. When the Chinese junk he eventually stowed away on reached the open sea, Sia Yung presented himself to the ship's captain and offered to work as a crewman to pay for his passage. Traveling in a southwesterly direction across the South China Sea, stopping to unload and load cargo at seaports along the route, the ship eventually entered the waters of the Gulf of Thailand, where it dropped anchor at the port city of Lam, Sing, on Thailand's southeastern coast. Finding conditions there favorable for beginning a new life, Sia Ong, soon to be the father of Ajahn Jia Chundo, 
disembarked carrying only his woven bamboo traveling case and sought employment in the bustling city. Although Ajahn Jia's father turned out to be a minor character in the following account of his son's life, he nonetheless exerted an important influence on his son's temperament and the effect it had on his bold, direct, and assertive personality. Ajahn Jia's father was an ethnic Hokkien, and the young Jia inherited from him the inherent character traits typical of Hokkien people. Even when speaking with close friends and family, Hokkien people tended to shout and remonstrate in loud and forceful voices as if they were quarreling among themselves. The Hokkien viewed loud and brassy speech simply as an effective and confident way to communicate. Although they sounded rude using profanity in ordinary conversation, they did not intend their words to be offensive. In their minds, they were just bantering good-naturedly. Ajahn Jia himself became well known for his uncultured character traits and his use of uncompromisingly forthright or even crude language in everyday conversation, behavior which at times led to public controversy. Ajahn Jia possessed a dynamic personality, resourceful and full of energy, strong-willed and adamantly self-assured. Like his father, he was a physically imposing man with a tireless work ethic, which could easily lead to confrontations when obstacles blocked his path. When Ajahn Jia eventually agreed to recount the story of his life, his strict, no-nonsense character was on full display as he raised the curtain to look back on his life as a forest monk, with the hopes, goals, adventures, and lessons learned taking center stage. He guided his listeners through a biographic landscape of intersecting people, places, and events that focused attention on the fierce and resolute temperament that shaped the course of events on his spiritual journey. In his storytelling, Ajahn Jia did not avoid addressing his own shortcomings, nor did he shy away from depicting the people with whom he interacted in the most candid and outspoken terms. In his rigorous pursuit of spiritual excellence, he was as demanding of himself as he was of his students. He was not all strictness and severity, however. Glimpses of his less daunting, more human side can be seen in the anecdotes he told about his eccentric habits and unorthodox behavior, which enable the reader to gain a fuller picture of his overall personality. By the time of the first interview, Ajahn Jia's enlightened mind, comfortably clothed in the discarded rags of his outward personality, engaged the world untouched by feelings of awkwardness or embarrassment. His account reads as though he was announcing to the world the confidence he felt in the depth and maturity of his understanding. Speaking honestly and openly about himself and his exploits, he concealed no hidden agendas or ulterior motives. He simply exhibited the stubborn, combative traits from which he had earned the moniker Gold Wrapped in Rags. On the afternoon of January 30th, 2000, a group of monks and lay devotees, who had practiced under Ajahn Jia's guidance for decades, approached him at his monastic residence with a special request. Would he kindly agree to tell the story of his life in full so that it could be recorded and preserved for the benefit of future generations? They were seeking an in-depth account of his personal experiences and reflections and were prepared to allow all the time he needed to relate his story. Then, eighty-four years old, Ajahn Jia was nearing the end of his life, he suffered from multiple physical ailments which had decimated his body and sapped his strength. Laying back in a rattan recliner with his feet elevated to ease his chronic pain, Ajahn Jia agreed to narrate the events of his life on the condition that his biography be used for the purpose of inspiring the present generation of monks and lay practitioners to put their faith in the traditional Buddhist practices that lead directly to liberation from suffering. Recordings taken from that and subsequent interviews became the oral history on which this book is based. While members of the group set up their video recording equipment, Ajahn Jia warned them that his memory had deteriorated along with his physical health, a handicap which was likely to affect the accuracy of his recollections. Nevertheless, he would do his best under the circumstances. The outcome was, in fact, a detailed account of the events that characterized Ajahn Jia's life and the extraordinary times in which he lived. With the exception of this introduction and the epilogue that concludes the book, the contents of this book were taken from those recorded interviews, which were conducted on a regular schedule over a period of several weeks. 
The voice recordings were later transcribed into the Thai language and published as an autobiography entitled A John Jia Chundo, Gold Wrapped in Rags. This book presents the English translation of the Thai version, which I have reworked for clarity and smoothness. The resulting English version is a carefully composed work. The selection of its materials and their arrangement into chapters is guided by a desire to highlight specific themes of Ajahn Jia's life and his path of practice. Ajahn Jia opened his narrative with the story of his father's emigration at a young age from South China to southeastern Thailand. He talked about the influence his parents had on his upbringing and temperament. He spoke about the time his mother and father met, recounted stories from his childhood and teenage years, and described his life as a monk, placing special emphasis on the many decades he lived the life of a forest monk alongside some of the most renowned meditation masters of the Thai forest tradition. Ajahn Jia was born in an age of foot travel and boat canals, candlelight and wood stoves, dirt roads and gravel streets, and agrarian social customs. It was a simple, uncomplicated era when virgin forests, carpeted with thick subtropical undergrowth, dominated much of Thailand's landmass, creating large expanses of wilderness that extended through many regions of the country. Where today roads wind through the countryside, at that time only narrow trails passed through the dense jungle terrain where village settlements were often located a day's walk apart. The forests surrounding those communities teemed with dangerous wild animals, making them appear frightening to the local inhabitants. It was in such sparsely inhabited wilderness locations that a John Jia would come to find the ideal environment for treading the Buddha's noble path to enlightenment. As can be expected from an off-the-cuff oral account of one's life, his narration of events sometimes lacked structure and consistency. Initially, recollection of episodes from his youth did not always follow the order in which they occurred. Instead, remembrances came to mind in a more random fashion, as the memory of an event or person from his childhood prompted him to describe a related incident that happened years later. For example, while relating his life as a young teenager, he interposed stories that happened after he became a monk, then promptly returned to the narrative of his teenage experiences. In such instances, I have rearranged the storyline by regrouping the sequence of events to reflect an accurate chronological order as much as possible. For instance, all stories relating to his monastic life are placed together, some occurring at the time of his ordination, others in the years following it. Other sections of the narrative have been moved around and inserted in places where they seem to better fit the biographical order of events, making this English narrative flow smoothly from one story to the next. Due to their conversational tone, a John Gia's recollections often seem to ramble and meander from one episode to the next, with the chain of events punctuated at intervals by spontaneous Dhamma teachings. Had a John Gia chosen to edit the text himself before publication, perhaps he would have pared down some of the digressions and organized the story in a clearer structure. But as he expressed no interest in doing so, the original editing team was left to their own devices. Reluctant to deviate from Ajahn Jia's spoken word, the Thai editors transcribed his oral account just as he spoke it and published it without significant changes. Because Ajahn Jia used informal language that is more common in speech than in writing, his storytelling was naturally folksy and colloquial. Being unrehearsed, his speech was characterized less by complex grammatical structures and technical vocabulary, and more by the grammar, vocabulary, and idioms suitable for everyday language and conversation. Following along with the drift of his memories wherever they lead gives his account a down-to-earth, unpretentious quality. Consequently, his storytelling reads like one friend talking to another about his life. That informal style notwithstanding, when the subject of Dhamma came up in the story, Ajahn Jia's tone immediately became serious, restrained and circumspect, in response to and in respect for the Dhamma he was voicing. His account portrayed many episodes detailing the events that happened in his life, some of which culminated in vivid descriptions of the decisive experiences that occurred during crucial periods of his spiritual growth and development. He stuck to the practical details that defined each episode of his life and did not try to present a romanticized version of events. He was neither wistful nor nostalgic about the past. 
he accepted the inevitability of a changing world, remaining pragmatic and forward-looking throughout the narration. Because a John Gia spoke spontaneously about his life, some degree of exaggeration and embellishment, or occasional stretching of time and place, was liable to occur. A John Gia was often the only source of the accounts he gave and sometimes related his stories in more than one version, which inevitably gave rise to certain discrepancies and disparities. I attempted to reconcile seeming inconsistencies by prioritizing the most likely version, or in some cases combining details from several versions into one, and inserting it in its proper place in the chronology of events. To provide additional context for those events, the Thai editors sometimes added their own comments, or else quoted stories describing events in his life that were adapted from the comments of his contemporaries. When those comments were constructive, consistent with Ajahn Gia's purpose, and helpful in clarifying the circumstances that formed the setting for a specific episode, I incorporated them into the narrative. I have also edited out digressions that do not seem relevant to the ongoing narrative and that might merely add confusion to the storyline. The result, I hope, is a coherent and readable biographical account that makes a John Gia's deep dhamma accessible to a modern audience. A John Gia's oral account of his life ends around 1984, a full twenty years before he passed away. In lieu of Ajahn Jia's direct input, the Thai editors either commented on the last two decades of his life themselves or quoted accounts from other sources. These approaches, however, amounted to little more than a general overview, often lacking in detail and substance. To remedy that, I have taken what information the editors did provide, combined that with other descriptions I could find, and used that material to construct a narrative of the end of Ajahn Jia's life. The resulting conclusion to this biography, captured in an epilogue entitled Dusk, is centered around two major themes of his final years. The construction of his monastery, Buridatta Forest Monastery, and the gradual deterioration of his physical body. In order to paint a coherent picture of the events that occurred during the construction of Buridatta Forest Monastery, I collected and compared comments made by his disciples with information gleaned from photographs taken at various stages during the first ten years of that period. I then wove these together into a description that captures the enormous effort, cooperation, and generosity required for such an endeavor, and one that functions as a cautionary tale of the dangers that comfort and excess can bring to a community striving for genuine release from suffering. So as to accurately depict a John Gia's physical decline, and his unwavering resilience in the face of the cumulative health issues he experienced during the years prior to his death, I first consulted the relatively limited material provided by the original editors. This included a series of bullet points listing Ajahn Gia's medical conditions, the doctors who treated him, particular dates of note, and the hospitals where he received treatment. From there I researched the various illnesses to the point where I could accurately describe their typical symptoms and used that knowledge in conjunction with photographs from the period to add more details to the sequence of events leading up to his death. As the decline in his health paralleled other incidents that took place in his old age, I employed that association to draw the story of a John Gia's life to a close, culminating in the final passing of the spiritual warrior on August 23, 2004. Throughout the course of this translation, I have endeavored to follow a time-honored tradition of Buddhist biography which places as much emphasis on the lessons learned from the moral consequences of the events described as it does on the events themselves. In other words, a Dhamma lesson waiting to be told can be found embedded in every episode of Ajahn Jia's life. Ajahn Jia himself employed the method of using recollections about his life as a means of introducing his audience to important lessons regarding the practical aspects of the Buddha's teachings. Ajahn Jia's narratives were told from the vantage point of an elderly and mature teacher. His principal motive for relating his life story was clearly instructional, his teaching activity being focused primarily on the forest monks under his care. He believed that talking about his experiences would encourage them in their training and clarify the true purpose of Buddhist meditation practices to help them avoid falling victim to doubt and confusion. During the interviews, he frequently broke the narrative to press home a point or lesson he believed to be of special benefit to monks in the audience. These digressions, 
which tend to give his narrative a somewhat episodic and disjointed quality, took several forms. Sometimes they relay short moral tales and direct exhortations of advice and caution to his listeners. At other times these digressions are profound teachings on moral virtue, meditative calm and concentration, and insight meditation techniques. Because Ajahn Jia spoke about Buddhist practice from his own personal experience, these Dhamma teaching interludes also lent the storyline the purpose and authority to allay doubt and instill confidence in the audience. Ajahn Jia lived and practiced within a Buddhist monastic tradition where monks were usually tight-lipped about their personal stories and autobiographies were almost non-existent. Never one to comply with conventions, Ajahn Jia boldly proclaimed the methods he used and results he gained at each stage of his spiritual training. In that sense, he left a record of his life and meditation experiences that in both extent and detail was unusual in Thai Buddhism. The inclination to talk about his own life increased with age and had become a prominent feature of his teaching style by the time the interview for this book took place, prompting Ajahn Jia to openly discuss the full range of his spiritual attainments. The narrative's rambling style and rhythm seem just right as a reflection on the austere nomadic lifestyle Ajahn Jia led for much of his monastic life. Deeply impressed by stories he was told about Buddhist monks whose great virtue enabled them to undertake ascetic practices that would seem incredible to most, he embarked on a strict regimen of monastic training in an attempt to emulate them. Inspired by heroic tales of the hardships that illustrious Buddhist figures of the past had overcome in the struggle to reach enlightenment, he set out on the Buddhist path with high hopes, eager to start his formal practice. He believed that a monk who commits himself to attaining the end of all suffering must push forward with unwavering determination and maintain that momentum, whatever the difficulties encountered, until the ultimate goal is achieved. Since the time of the Buddha, the lifestyle of a Buddhist monk has been modeled after the life of a homeless wanderer. Such a spiritual aspirant, having renounced the world and gone forth from his home and family, dressed in simple robes stitched together from discarded cloth, depended on alms food for his meals, and took the forest environment as his dwelling place. Buddhist renunciation practices based on that Spartan lifestyle and exercised for the sake of spiritual progress on the Buddha's path to enlightenment became known as Dutanga. The austere nature of those practices provided the supporting structure for meditation methods used by forest-dwelling monks throughout the history of Buddhist monasticism, which helps to explain why ascetic practices have always been deeply woven into the fabric of Buddhism. The early 20th century witnessed an extraordinary revival of that traditional monastic lifestyle. The resurgence, which would come to be known as the Thai forest tradition, was an attempt to revitalize ancient standards of Buddhist practice. Forest living, moral discipline, and meditation in search of the Buddha's path to enlightenment that had long been missing in the monastic culture of the day. During this revival, as in previous eras of Buddhist Renaissance, the role of forest monks in Thailand came to be that of masters of ascetic practices and of meditation techniques that enabled them to directly access another order of reality and to transmit the knowledge resulting from that access to their disciples. The power perceived to have been generated by forest monks' sexual abstinence, ascetic practices, and above all their dedication to meditation, motivated generations of followers to venerate them and to strive to emulate their austere way of life. By the time Ajahn Jia entered the monkhood in 1937, the forest monks of Thailand had established a strong meditation tradition grounded in the thirteen Dutanga ascetic practices authorized and encouraged by the Buddha. They referred to their ascetic lifestyle as Tudong, an abbreviated form of the word Dutanga. The Tudong concept encompassed not only observing all or some of the Dutangas and other renunciate practices, but also more broadly to the custom of a forest monk trekking alone on foot for months through sparsely populated wilderness areas. Arduous journeys that often tested a monk's spiritual strength and stamina to the limit. While traveling, Dutanga monks of Ajahn Jia's generation carried only their basic requisites, the three principal robes, an alms bowl, a razor, a belt, needles and thread, a water strainer, and an umbrella tent, a cloth curtain hung from the edge of a homemade umbrella that formed a tent-like shelter when suspended from the branch of a tree. 
Their daily lives were full of forests and mountains, rivers and streams, caves, overhanging cliffs, and dangerous wild animals. They moved from place to place by hiking along narrow wilderness tracks in remote frontier regions where village communities were scarce. Since their lives depended on the alms food they collected from those small settlements, wandering Dutanga monks never knew precisely where they would find their next meal and were prepared, when circumstances dictated, to receive no food at all. They simply relied on strict discipline and fierce determination to see them through the difficult challenges they set for themselves. After his ordination, Ajahn Jia joined the ranks of those intrepid forest monks who undertook Dutanga ascetic practices to rid their minds of encumbering defilements. Accomplishing that goal required nothing short of a revolution in the mental habits by which a monk managed his daily life. Such a transformation in turn entailed commitment, courage, and a lifetime of persistence and discipline. That meditative lifestyle combined periods of settled living when monks gathered in forest monastic communities to train under a reputable ajahn, or teacher, with the nomadic Dutanga existence they pursued once their training was completed. Ajahn Jia's introduction to the Dutanga practices began with life in a forest monastic community where he lived under the watchful tutelage of Ajahn Kong Ma, a senior monk respected for his wisdom. Inside the monastery, his life was regulated by an intensive regimen in which discipline restrained a monk at every turn, in the routines of meditation, in the procedures of the Dhamma Hall, in the teacher and disciple protocols, in morning and evening chanting before the Buddha statue, and in the disciplinary precepts that Buddhist monks observed. Ajahn Jia was taught foundational Buddhist meditation themes like mindfulness focused on the meditation word Budo and contemplation of the human body. By emphasizing respect for traditional monastic values in this way, forest monasteries were able to maintain the integrity of their monks' commitment to authentic Buddhist practices. Although many forest monks lived and studied with their teachers for years before daring to strike out on their own, Ajahn Jia, with his bold and adventuresome temperament, was a notable exception. Over time, Ajahn Jia became one of a group of forest monks who pioneered the use of new and innovative Dutanga strategies, helping to add new dimensions to the Buddha's time-honored ascetic practices. In parallel with their solid training in discipline and meditation, forest monasteries also required their monks to regularly observe certain core Dutanga practices, living in the forest, walking on alms round each day, eating only one meal a day, and eating all food directly from their alms bowls. Monks were also encouraged to experiment with other Dutanga practices that they felt suited their temperament, for example wearing only robes that were made from discarded cloth, living out of doors, camping at the foot of a tree in a cave or under an overhanging cliff, and the practice of never lying down. These practices were considered advanced forms of asceticism to be undertaken at the discretion of individual monks when they felt they were ready to intensify their meditation and test their inner strength to the limit. Ajahn Jia's narrative reveals his deep appreciation of the natural world. His account indicates that many regions of Thailand were rich in pristine old-growth forests, clear water rivers and streams, wide caves where the air was cool and fresh, mountains watered by natural springs, and an abundance of wildlife. It was an environment of immense biodiversity that had remained virtually untouched in South and Southeast Asia, stretching back for millennia to the time of the Buddha. Although the emphasis placed on forest meditation practices waxed and waned through the centuries, the virgin wilderness never ceased to be a source of ideal seclusion for the spiritual training of dedicated practitioners. That situation changed radically, however, in the mid-twentieth century. In 1916, the year Ajahn Jia was born, nearly 70% of Thailand's landmass was blanketed by vast expanses of hardwood forests where a Dutanga monk could hike from one end of the country to the other through uninterrupted wilderness. Due to subsequent rampant deforestation, by the time Ajahn Jia passed away in 2004, only 20% of the country remained forested, and those dwindling wilderness areas were mostly confined to national forest reserves. Such wholesale destruction of old-growth wilderness areas 
meant that a forest monk's range of activity was eventually reduced to pockets of woodland, separated by extensive areas of cultivated rice fields and urban sprawl. The Buddhist monk's natural abode of rivers, mountains, and caves, which had endured unscathed for millennia, was confronted with the seemingly irreversible modern-day trend to lay the natural world to waste. Read from the perspective of that altered landscape, a John Gia's autobiography can be understood as both an ode paying tribute to perhaps the last golden era of Buddhist ascetic practices, and as a swan song heralding the sunset of the ideal meditation environment that for so long made those unique modes of practice possible. Although a crucial element in forest practice had been lost during his lifetime, Ajahn Jia did not want his successors in Buddhist practice to become prisoners of time and place. Instead, he threw down the gauntlet to future generations of Buddhist practitioners, challenging them to remain true under all circumstances to traditional Buddhist practices that lead directly to liberation from suffering. Gold Wrapped in Rags presents the real and true account of Ajahn Jia's life and practice, disclosing for us not only the character and personality of the man who lived his transient life on this earth, but also the noble goal that he transcended his earthly persona to attain, and the means by which he threw back the shabby shroud of that persona to reveal the pure gold veiled behind those tattered rags.